and welcome in author of Illegal Procedure, a sports agent, comes, comes clean on the dirty business of college football, Josh Lux, a college, a former sports agent for two-plus decades. Josh, how are you doing tonight? Hey, good evening, guys. How are you? Thanks a lot for joining us. Um, the first thing I want to get to is what made you write this book, if you could give our listeners a little background. Well, I mean, it, it, was, it was spawned from the uh, Sports Illustrated article that came out in October of 2010 that was co-authored by me and a guy named George Dorman, who is Pulitzer Prize winning writer for Sports Illustrated, who I'm sure many of your listeners are familiar with. And uh, George is the same guy that, you know, wrote that huge cover story on Ohio State as well. And, uh, and a number of the other scandals that uh, that are covered and have been covered since my story came out. Um, but uh, there was a lot of pressure put on me personally from um, from the industry that uh, I was leaving, and I had a uh, dispute with another agent, and it it really stemmed from that. At the end of the day, uh, that's what uh, inspired the Sports Illustrated story. I was approached by uh, George Dorman. And he had uh, provided me with a platform, an opportunity to uh, share my story uh, and, uh, and let people know what was really going on in the business. And the hope is that, you know, as I've left the industry, um, I can shed some light on uh, the practices uh, uh, that are basically commonplace in our business uh, for everyone to see, kind of pull the curtain back, uh, and hopefully that leads to some sort of positive change, and I guess everyone has a different definition of, of what that would be, uh, but in my world and in my eyes, uh, it would be to figure out a way to get the players in college football the opportunity to, uh, to get paid for the work that they do, uh, and at the very least, uh, have health care, because uh, you don't have to play in the NFL to have head injuries and degenerative conditions in your knees and your back and your ankles and everything else. You know, just a couple of years of college football will do that for you. And the way things are structured now, because they're not employees, there's no workers' compensation benefits. And although we all, you know, root for our alma mater and root for the school and, and we take so much pride in the players' performance on the field, uh, what's not really very well known is that a lot of these players are living below the poverty line. There's a, a shortfall that exists between the cost of full attendance and what the, the scholarship provides. And I think what's even worse is that many of these athletes are are very prepared to play a football game, but they're very ill prepared to compete academically. Uh, so uh, they're thrust into these situations, and uh, and they they may get a degree at some point, but they certainly don't get the education that they're promised. We're talking with Josh Lux, uh, author of Illegal Procedure. Um, we'll stick here in Carolina with that in the statement you just made about players. Basically, what's your opinion on Jadonovan Clowney right now, South Carolina guy? He's kind of not giving it his all. Do you think that's smart of him, or what would you say? Well, first of all, I don't, I don't know if it's, if it's fair to say that he's not giving it his all, but he certainly uh, has given some thought to the reality that players get injured and their values can uh, be diminished as a result of an injury on the field. Um, you know, time and time again, I mean, Willis McGahee is a great example. Everybody points to Willis. and Well, he, he overcame that horrific knee injury and he came back and he, he was still a high draft choice. But what people fail to realize is that the kind of money at the top five uh, in the top five or top ten of the draft is very different uh, than, than the kind of money players are getting guaranteed in the 25s, uh, you know, down into the middle of the second round. Uh, at the top of the draft, you've got the kind of money that could create multi-generational financial stability. And, um, you know, once you get into that third round even, um, you know, after taxes and whatnot, uh, sure, there's a lot of money there, but the average career lasts three and a quarter years. And uh, many of the players, uh, you know, are not put in a position to get that big payday up front. Um, and, uh, and they have very little to show for their time and their efforts uh, if they don't cash in when the opportunity arises. So I see nothing wrong uh, with, uh, with what Jadavian, uh, what you guys think he may or may not be doing. I don't know. Uh, but he's one hell of a talent. He's one heck of a player. And um, he's an extremely valuable um, uh, uh, draw. To the universities, and he's not getting paid for his efforts. 
and he also isn't receiving any health care. And the type of insurance that was provided to him by, through the NCAA, what's acceptable is a career-ending injury, but very, very few of these athletes suffer from career-ending injuries. A lot of times uh, they're hurt and their value uh, is diminished, and there is, uh, they just not provided the type of insurance that's for the decrease in value based on their draft stock. And, um, you know, it's unfortunate that that's not provided to them. I agree with you that he's one heck of an athlete, and I, I don't necessarily think he's not giving it his all, but to move, on, to move on from that, what you know about sports agents, do you think he's been approached by agents, and if he has, has any kind of gifts been given to him, do you think? Well, I can't say specifically to him, and I don't think, you know, I've never met him, I don't know him, I don't know his family, you know, situation, his financial situation, um, you know, but I would say that there's, a, that there's very few top prospects um, that are not receiving some sort of a benefit, whether it be from an athlete uh, agent or a booster, uh, whether it be from, uh, you know, uh, through a coach. Uh, the, I, would, I would contend that very few athletes are actually eligible to play college football, whether it be as a result of academics or as a result of receiving some sort of improper benefit from a coach or an agent, any source. Sticking here in Carolina, the Tar Heels vacated all their wins from 2008 to 2009. They decreased their scholarships by nine over a three-year period and even issued themselves a two-year probation. But the NCAA didn't think that was enough. They gave them a year suspension and a year postseason ban. What was your connection with UNC? Well, I mean, it, it, nothing specifically with the University of North Carolina, but I did have connections to somebody that was in the eye of the storm, uh, both Gary Wishard is a gentleman that I worked with, and in fact, he led to uh, my uh, uh, coming out and speaking about uh, my my story and my situation. It was a dispute that I had with Wishard, and at the time that I was working with Gary Wishard, I also worked very closely with John Blake, who uh, was at the center of that controversy. So, um, you know, I I was asked by the NCAA at that time to um, to share my experiences after I had come out with my story, and I have no problem speaking openly about what happened. And uh, so they've been made very aware, and it was a part of that, uh, that whole process. And, uh, you know, what's really frustrating for me is the, um, the inconsistency when it comes to penalties. And, you know, North Carolina, quite honestly, based on what I know happened there, they could have been hit a lot harder. But if you look at what happened at the University of Miami most recently, I think it's very distressing and it's quite disgusting. And uh, every college football fan should be outraged if you like North Carolina, Ohio State, or USC um, to see that uh, the the member institutions that yield the most power uh, have the ability to skate the rules. And that's what happened there over an extended period of time. And uh, unfortunately, the punishment didn't fit the crime. You, you mentioned the inconsistency. The University of Miami football program loses nine scholarships over the next three years, and the entire athletic program has been placed on a three-year probation. In your eyes and what you know about college football and being an agent, what does probation really mean? Not much. Um, don't do it again. We're watching you more closely. Um, you know, the fact is that the, there's a structure here in big-time college sports of self-monitoring. Um, and in, in such a competitive business, um, obviously, uh, what, what's been shown over the last number of years is that model um, is broken. It doesn't work. And whether it be Miami, where Nevin Shapiro was, you know, intimately involved with Donna Shalala and all the folks there donating big checks, big chunks of money that apparently were as a result of him scanning people from Ponzi schemes, or if you uh, want to turn your attention to, uh, you know, what's happened at uh, at Auburn recently uh, with Cam Newton uh, or some other scandals at Alabama. It, it just seems to me that, I, I, better yet, Jerry Tarkanian said it better than I ever could, that when the University of Kentucky breaks the rules, I think something like uh, Connecticut State needs to be very nervous. <laughs> so it's, it, 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 it's like, you know, if the big bully comes in and punches you in the face and then you turn around and you beat up somebody smaller. And that's what the NCAA seems to be doing time and time again. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not right. And, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of wrongs there. There's a lot that can be fixed with the system, but there's a lot that's wonderful about the opportunities that are presented to these athletes as well. 
and I hope we can at some point move towards some kind of uh, of happy medium where everybody gets what they want. But the reality is that a, a system that is a lot like 1920s prohibition in a lot of ways, where it leaves the participants hungry and it leaves them needy, um, it, it opens themselves up to uh, you know greed finding them. You know, where wherever need exists, greed follows. I agree with you completely. I don't know if you know Nevin Shapiro, but over your two plus decades of uh, being a sports agent, how many guys like Nevin Shapiro did you know? You know, he seemed, from what I could tell, and I didn't know him, but um, he, he seemed like a, a, from what I read, a, a, a very rare bird. But that wasn't to say that there weren't people around big programs that that brought in beautiful women. I mean. Uh, whether it be prostitutes or, or spirit girls or hostesses at universities, I had plenty of athletes that told me stories. And that's why it's so frustrating that people seem to focus their attention based upon the coaches that have the microphone and have the podium, and they like to point the finger at the agents. And I'm not saying agents are innocent, because Lord knows they are very guilty in a lot of ways. But I don't think the coaches at these big programs are any better. Um, they turn their head or they have other people doing their bidding for them. The rules are being broken, uh, and, uh, and uh, they are participating. And, and they're participating either by turning their head and allowing underlings to go ahead and do their job for them. And that's not just in football. It's even worse in basketball, and it happens sooner. So, you know, let's just call a spade a spade. The whole thing is dirty, and, uh, you know, the rules are not being followed, and I don't think they can be enforced. Because quite frankly, it's it's a um, uh, it's it's a broken model and it's a system that can't possibly function. It's a it's a socialist system trying to operate in a capitalist society. Figure out how that's going to work. If you looked at just the Miami case and not NCAA as a whole, but just the Miami case, who would you point the blame at? For what? For players getting benefits? Um, who do I point the blame at? I, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, everybody everybody's responsible. There's no one individual that's responsible. Everyone participates. But I think that it's, it's more about a flawed system than it is about an individual or pointing blame. If you want to blame somebody, blame the system. That's who's de who deserves the blame, if anyone, the system in, at, at a whole. And that's not saying the NCAA, because people seem to like to point a finger. It's like the Death Star or something. The reality is, is the NCA is made up of, a, of the member institutions, and that membership, they're the ones who decide what exist and how they should be followed and how things should be done. So it's the member institutions that, that quite frankly, it falls on their feet. And if the NCAA is ever taken out and we change our system, I suspect that they're going to end up coming up with a new set of letters, and it's going to be a new NCAA, but it's going to be more of the same. And that's, that, that would be something that I would, I would think is going to happen over the next five to ten years. It's going to be more of the same with a different label. What's your opinion? Jay Billis made that story about two months ago when he did the search on NCAA.com or .org or whatever it is. Did the search and basically showed you search Manziel, you find a Manziel jersey. You say, search Winston, you find a Winston jersey. How, how is it fair that the NCAA is able to make money off these players but the players in return can't make money? Well, I, I, you know, it's not fair, and that's part of the issue. And you look at the Ed O'Bannon case that was recently settled, which I thought, you know, gosh, we have a chance here to really take them down. I mean, the fact of the matter is that, um, you know, the NCAA can benefit from, uh, from, from, from the sale of these jerseys and other merchandise. If you recall, uh, if you're familiar with it, um, uh, the original uh, mission of the NCAA at its inception was to protect student athletes from being exploited by commercial enterprise. And what's evolved over time is that the NCAA themselves have actually become the commercial enterprise that's doing the exploiting. Let me ask you this question. You see that uh, NCAA football, the video game, has come to an end with its agreement or whatever they had with NCAA. Do you think that stuff is starting to happen now because colleges like Miami are coming out and these searches are coming out and they're showing all this money that's being made and the NCAA is trying to back their way away from that? Remember, who is the NCAA? Let's just remember, it is the, it is the member institutions that make up the NCAA. So, uh, you know, they, they've got this, everybody has this idea that this is a nonprofit and that college sports is nonprofit. Uh, for a nonprofit, they make an awful lot of money. 
And um, so, so that's very frustrating when, when you continue to hear these people defend themselves and hide behind this academic curtain and claiming that they're educating people, and that's why they deserve nonprofit status. And by the way, when you actually re- recognize the kind of money that these programs make and college sports as a whole and what kind of profit they actually do make, everybody should be outraged at the thought that they pay absolutely no taxes. That's that's disgusting. They pay no benefits to the players' long-term health care. There's multi-year scholarships don't exist. If a player gets hurt when he's playing college football, they can pull his scholarship, and and they're year to year to year. And there are case there are cases after cases where that's happened to athletes. And what's worse is that they don't pay a dime in taxes, and they expect to be subsidized long-term. Remember. An athlete can't get money and he can't get a job when he's playing college sports. They expect any shortfall to be picked up through Pell Grants and other things that are in place. And a Pell Grant is nothing more than than, than taxpayer-subsidized welfare. So you have a, a college athlete who's hungry, who's, a, who's allowed to collect welfare, but he's not allowed to get a job. I think we have to think really long and hard about a system that's structured that way. Oh, I agree with you 100%. I think the athletes should be paid. And there's, I mean, like I've always made the argument about, you know, the kids in other departments who get scholarships who aren't doing anything, and then you have the kids that are on scholarships playing sports that, that are making all this money and not getting a dime for it. Moving on to your past Well, by, career, the, by the way, I just want to point out, you bring up a good point. The kids who are on academic scholarships are allowed to get jobs. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, oh, I completely agree with you. Moving on to your past career, two-plus decades, who was the biggest player that you were able to sign in, in quote unquote, the legal way that the NCAA and the Players Association allows you to? The biggest name or the biggest star? I mean, the biggest the money biggest, guy or the biggest name? The biggest, biggest name at the time. The biggest name would have been Maurice Claret. All right, I like that. Well, who's the biggest money star? Obviously, the money got bigger every single year, um, but I would say Terrell Suggs, or maybe Adam Archuleta, or Todd Heap all the Arizona State guys that went first round in the years that I was working with Richard. Um, you know, we did very well together, and uh, and those guys have gone on to have just spectacular careers. What tactics did you use to, as an agent to get these guys to sign with you? Are you, are you taking notes? Are you going to go out and try to do this, or are you going to stick to radio? <laughs> no, we're sticking to radio. There's, there, we, we can barely make our own sandwich, let alone get out there and... <laughs> Start a sports agency. You don't want to go hustle, huh? Well, you know, <laughs> there, there's uh, there's lots of different ways, and things have really evolved over time. And back when I started in uh, in 1990, I'd have to get on an airplane and fly cross country and track a guy down and wait for him outside the locker room. Or I did something. I I called it finding the fat chick is what I used to do. I used to fly <laughs> over there. And outside of every sports program, athletic department, there was always a fat chick wearing a warm-up suit from the <laughs> university. And, and, and this chick knew where every player was. They knew, she was in love with all of them, knew all of their schedules, knew where they lived. And all I had to do was cozy up to that fat chick, and she would tell me where to go where to find guys. Happened every single time. You can count on it. And nowadays it's a little bit different because we have the Internet and we have, um, you know, social media and Twitter and Facebook and Lord knows what else the heck, you know, is, is around the corner. And uh, now people are getting tagged in photos. Um, they do things called ghosting, which is a way that, uh, that people can reach big-time athletes now. Anyone can do it. You guys can try it and see if it works. Maybe you'll do it with Jadavian Clowney. Uh, find a picture of a very well-endowed, beautiful girl and create a fake profile just like they did with, uh, with Manti Teo and send a friend request. Uh, with that girl in a bikini or whatever the heck you want her to wear. And 99% of the time, the athlete's accepting the friend request. And once you're into their Facebook page or whatever else, and Instagram, they talk about where they're going and what they're doing. And it's really easy to just bump into them and find them and track them down. It's called ghosting. And, um, you know, that's a tact. That's an approach that you, that's used nowadays. And quite honestly, it's the modern-day fat chick. <laughs> that's that's like catfishing there. That, that's like an MTV catfish to me. Long uh, before it was catfish. Long before it was catfish, it was fat chick. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
moving on, who is the biggest name? I mean, you don't have to answer this before you do, though. Uh, who is the biggest name player that you were able to sign in the other opposite way instead of using the legal tactic, the, the money-handing tactic? Gosh, I had players living with me. Um, well, the highest draft choice was the 10th pick in the draft, Jameer Miller. And oddly enough, he ended up, uh, you know, he was considered to, uh, by the NFLPA to be one of their uh, front runners to be the head of the NFLPA at some point. And he was also on the uh, Committee for Infractions where he was helping to decide and dole out punishment uh, to agents and others that broke the rules. And I was paying him every single month that he was in school and he was taking my cigar boxes and using it to stash his weed. Wow. Wow. Yeah, I didn't know I didn't know you had guys living with you. How does that work when you have like these college athletes or guys living with you and they're like lying about it? Well they're not lying to me. I know they're living with me. <laughs> How are they able to pull that off though and the NCAA doesn't find out about that? Uh, the NCAA doesn't see, and, and quite honestly, the school doesn't want to know, and they turn their heads, and that's just the way it continues to go. Uh, reading all these articles that I've read about you, one of the biggest guys that you gave money to is Ryan Leaf. Uh, you gave a large sum of money to him. Um, did you ever consider in that year going after Payne Manning? Well, it wouldn't have made a whole lot of sense, and it's kind of funny because um, you know there were a lot of other agents that felt that they had to choose one or the other. I had gotten involved with Ryan Leaf um, his sophomore year, and he had a lot of credit card debt, and I took care of that. And then we, you know, we traveled together, hung out together. He was like a little brother to me. Um, and uh, you know, it was an unfortunate uh, a series of events, and he ended up signing with uh, another agent that I believed um, is very uh, tied to the head coach at the university where he played. And as a result, he went that direction, and you know, and, and uh, you know, at the end of the day, it was very disappointing, um, and, and it was somebody that, uh, you know, we were tight, we were close. I mean, we we were very close friends, and I remember sitting in a jacuzzi with the guy once, um, you know, having a uh, smoking a cigar, hanging out with the guy, and we had played a round of golf, and and he had just come back from the Playboy, um, a photo shoot for the Playboy All American. Uh, uh, event, and it was he and Peyton Manning that were the two quarterbacks. And I remember sitting in in the in the hot tub, you know, hanging out, and him telling me story about Peyton Manning, and and after the 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 dinner or banquet or whatever it was that they had, uh, you know, Peyton said he needed to cut out, he needed to go up and get him some shut eye, and he was you know talking about him like this country bumpkin, and 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 how he wanted to go out and party. You know, and quite honestly, at the moment, at that time, I thought to myself, "Wow, this guy's got some Kenny Stabler in him," you know, and he's he's uh, he's one of those guys that's that's going to be able to figure it out like the snake. He's going to party hard, and he's going to play hard, and he's he's just going to be a stud. And um, you know, but deep down inside, I thought to myself, "Wow, that Peyton Manning seems like an awfully responsible guy, wise beyond his years," and uh, and I wished it was Peyton hanging out smoking a cigar with me. Uh, instead of Ryan. Yeah, yeah, I think I think we all do. Uh, one of the uh, another guy that you talked to and you tried to, I believe, tried to sign with San Antonio Holmes. I'm a big Jet fan. He mentioned to you. I read in the article. He mentioned to you that he was already being paid by another agent. Did he ever mention to you who the agent was? Yes, he did. Yeah. He, Can you go on record? He, I, I've already I've already said it before. I mean, he he at the time said that he was getting paid by Joel Siegel and he'd been taking care of his family for years. Now, um, Sports Illustrated didn't print it, uh, but I've gone on and said it everywhere else. Um, and you know, so you know, if Joel wants to come after me, bring it. I'd love to. I, I know where the, I know where the bones are buried. You know, the amazing thing is that everything I've shared, everything I've said, nobody sued me. Nobody oh, that's filed the lawsuit against me. And you know, I mentioned over 30 players, and I I pointed the finger at myself and others in the process, and nobody sued me. Not one, not one athlete, not one agent, nobody. Um, so, uh, I think that tells you something. And if and if anybody yeah. wanted to file against me, bring it on. I'll be more than happy <laughs> to 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 lay out discovery, and uh, and I can it, it, I can find out all the other players that you've paid, and I'll, I know exactly what the roadmap is, and I'll find it. So bring it. We're speaking with Josh Lux, author of Illegal Procedure. Um, yeah, and from all the things that I read, that the people that they talked to, only a few people denied actually anything you said. 
most of the people agreed to it. I didn't know about the Jonathan Ogden thing. I thought that was kind of crazy. But um, one last thing for money, man. We just went to a Janet Jackson concert. Yeah, you got, you yeah, you got free, yeah, yeah, you got a free tickets. Uh, well, no, what's I, was, your version but I, I went too. I went too. You know, I mean, it was he was my date. Um, <laughs> and, and it's not that comfortable sitting next to somebody six eight, three hundred and sixty pounds at the. It was at the fabulous forum, and those seats are kind of tight. So, um, you know, it was almost like I was sitting on his lap, and he was screaming out for Janet Jackson like a a nine year old girl the entire night in my ear. It really was just. It was like, you know, wrenching. It was very painful. <laughs> when when thirty for thirty in the dotted line they approached you. How long did it take you to make the decision that you wanted to do it? I, I, there was no decision to make. You know, I have no problem doing that stuff. There'll be a new thirty for thirty that I'm participating in that's coming out. I can't tell you who it, it's it's uh, it's centered around. Uh, I'm sworn to secrecy, but uh, it should be airing after the uh, right around Heisman time, and it'll blow everyone's mind. But um, it, I have, I had I had no qualms about you know participating in that. Um, you know, for balance, um, they needed a bad guy. They needed a villain. And um, quite honestly, uh, I think back then when my story had come out and the HBO piece was done, the Bryant Gumbel uh, Real Sports piece, um, you know, people might have pointed a finger and thought that I was really the bad guy. But now I think um, over time, I think public opinion has shifted. And people realize that you know, uh, it's emblematic of a bigger problem. You know, this is systemic. And whether it's Josh Lux or it's whoever, I mean, I don't want to put myself in a category of Nevin Shapiro, quite honestly. I, I was not, you know, never involved in things like that. Uh, I just paid <laughs> players. But, you know, at, at the end of the day, um, you know, you can, you can get rid of one, but another one's going to pop up and another one in their place. And the reason why is because the need exists. And wherever there's need, greed follows. That's all. So put the players in a situation where they're not needy, and then the system will get better, and then it'll be enforceable. Who is the one athlete that you really wanted, but you ended up he ended up signing with somebody else? Well, it was Ryan Leaf. I mean, quite honestly, I I I had set myself up. I had the uh, the number one pay, number one quarterback drafted the year prior to Leaf, and Tony Banks, my partner, Doc Daniels, and I, God rest his soul, and. Um, you know, having Ryan Leaf the next year, um, you know, that was that was a big fish back to back, and it, and it would have allowed us to really compete at a higher level, um, and it would have been a great springboard um, and, and helped to accelerate where I was going in, in my career. Um, you know, there were a lot of things that were going on with me personally at that time. I had buried my mom, and my father was terminally ill, and I went on to bury my father seven months after burying my mother, and. Uh, and that was followed by this horrible disappointment of Ryan Leaf, uh, which clearly doesn't compare, uh, you know, to what I had dealt with. But by the same token, um, it would have um, – I actually also believe I could have helped Ryan quite a bit. In my heart of hearts, I felt like I'd have been there and I would have shielded him from all of his – shielded him from himself. Uh, and what he needed was somebody who was going to be hands-on. And I felt like I, I, I could have made a difference in his life. And I'm sorry that it didn't work out for either of us. Uh, Two-part question for you. The 30 for 30 that you're partaking in, I know you can't tell me much about it. Can you tell me who the director is? Nope. <laughs> I can't tell you anything. Okay. <laughs> I, okay. I got, I, I, you know, I've said too much. That, that's fine. I'm going to assume that it's about a former Heisman running back. If that's if I'm in the ballpark, I I hope I am. I'm thinking I know who it's about, but I'm not sure. Uh, uh, I, I can't th tell you, but, uh, but at the end of the day, it's going to be really interesting. I uh, can't wait for it when it comes out. We'll definitely get you back on. One last thing before we let everybody get out of here. Um, we do what's called the last call. It's basically a shout-out to anything you want to give a shout-out to. What would be your last call? <sighs> wow. You kind of caught me off guard with this one. Um, and this is in North Carolina. I, so, I give a yeah. shout-out to, shout to, shout to Butch Davis. How about that? I hope he's listening. <laughs> because, be, because he's a victim of circumstance. And because he had absolutely no idea what was going on, and I don't think that he even had, you know, an inkling and probably shouldn't have known. And unfortunately, he was a great coach who uh, who ended up, uh, you know, taking a fall that he shouldn't have taken. So if I'm giving a shout-out, it's to a great coach in Butch Davis. Um, I know you're not currently a 
NFL agent, but I read somewhere that you still represent clients. Is that true? Uh, no, I don't. I don't represent athletes in any way. I've, okay. I have actually. My life is way better. I am removed about six years. I am uh, a recovering sports agent, and um, <laughs> and and I now work in commercial real estate. And I look back on my time. Uh, there are things that I I, um, I miss. But I have time with my two daughters. I get to go to every soccer game and every tennis match, and I'll be having dinner with my kids as soon as I get off the phone with you guys. And my life is way better. I'm making more money, and uh, I've got a higher quality of life, and I'm not chasing 20, 20 21-year-old kids across the country wiping their rear ends anymore. Um, you know, yeah, I'm in a much better place, and and it was a blessing in disguise. Josh Lux, awesome stuff, author of Illegal Procedure. Uh, when's the chance that we'll ever see you on a million dollar listing? Yeah, well, I, I do commercial. I do apartment buildings and retail centers and, and, and bigger stuff than houses. Um, but I know a couple of those guys. Uh, they're out here in L.A. too. But, you know, commercial isn't quite as sexy. Um, you know, an old Armenian guy that owns a warehouse, an industrial center. You know, people don't want to see me interact with him. The beautiful women on that show sitting on the beach, those are the kind of folks that uh, the people tune in for. Um, you know, not who I'm dealing with. <laughs> Josh Lux, all Awesome stuff, author of Illegal Procedure. When that 30 for 30 comes out, I hope we can get you back on that. All right, feel free to reach out, my best guys, and you know any any of your listeners. Hopefully, they've uh, they've picked up a copy of the book because uh, uh, Illegal Procedure. There's there's a lot in there, and uh, when you look back on when it was written, uh, you'll recognize there's a whole lot of things. There's a lot of water under the bridge. There's a lot that's happened since then. So it can be had uh, at on Amazon.com or I think in Barnes and Noble across the country. You know, feel free to grab it, and uh, it's a quick read, and I'm, I'm sure it'll be enlightening. I'm going to send my copy to you, and uh, will you will you autograph it for us? Absolutely, man. I'm going to write Pam right there on the front. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Josh Lux. I hope we catch up with you soon. You bet. Good night, guys.